So we're going to take a look at um, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13 uh, through 14. This is uh, Solomon bringing uh, the, the, the ark into the, into the tabernacle. And it says in verse 13, Indeed it came to pass that when the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard, in praising and, thank, and thanking the Lord. And when they had lifted their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not continue ministering because, because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would anoint me this morning to teach your message under the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Lord, give us ears to hear and give us an understanding heart this morning as we hear about the power of praising you, God. And Father, in this we do, we give you the praise, we give you the glory, and we give you the honor in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Listen, this morning I want to talk about the fact that our country needs a breakthrough. Yeah. Whew, you talk about spiritual warfare going on greater and stronger than ever before. I, you know what? Our, our state needs a breakthrough. Our state needs a breakthrough. Thank God our, our governor signed the heartbeat bill. Amen. Thank God our president has defunded Planned Parenthood. Did you hear that? He's pulling resources, federal resources from plan. It's a law that was already written. He's just enforcing it. But when you do that, friends, you got to understand, you're going into the devil's territory. And he does not want you to do that. I have to tell you, just for a moment here, when you take a look at David and Goliath, anybody could have gone and taken out Goliath. I'm sure there was guys that knew how to do a sling a lot better than David. It was David that picked up the mantle that God had placed on him and walked in that authority. See, Goliath is rep represents that, that roaring lion that's out there. The devil that's constantly trying to scare people out of God's inheritance. Let me say that again. He doesn't want you to get the inheritance that, that he has laid aside for you. He does not want you to walk in the victory that God has declared through the promises of his word for you. Because he knows that if you take that authority, if you pick up that mantle like David picked up that mantle, there'll be an anointing on you that the greatest giant in the world can't even stop. Now, come on, church. I'm speaking to somebody this morning. You got to pick up what I'm putting. This is good. I'm, amen, Pastor Star. Way to go. I'll, I'll shout myself down this morning. Mm. By the way, it's good to see Kelly home with us. Can you give us a little wave there, girl? Always good to see her home from her work. But this morning, I want to talk about this power of breakthrough. Last week, I touched on it, but, but couldn't really dig into it. We, we took a look at Psalm 71, and the psalmist commits himself to God's care in this. He commits himself to God's care. Listen to this as he says, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong refuge to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandment to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Listen to how the psalmist is putting his trust. He's putting himself in God's care. He has enjoyed a life of faithful commitment. And through the experiences of communion with the Lord, he has learned that Yahweh is faithful. He has learned that God, that the Lord God, the Lord God that we serve, he has learned that he is faithful, church. I don't know about you, but to me, that's exciting. That's the rock that we can build a house on. 
That's the rock that we can, we can build a future on. That's a rock that doesn't shift in the sand. That's a solid rock. The psalmist understood this when he said, for you are my rock and my fortress. You see, church, when we begin to commit our praise to God, we are standing on the solid rock. We are standing on the fortress. We are putting our care in him, and we are saying to God, does not matter what's against me. I will praise your holy name. Even if I'm in the midst of a battle, even if I'm in the midst of a war, I will stop on the solid rock, and I will praise your name because I'm going to put myself in your care. Church, I'm telling you, there's a breakthrough taking place even now. I can feel it in my spirit. See, the confidence of the Psalms holds and the variety of the lament and the thanksgiving that he's given. As an individual laments in Psalms and, and, and the aspect of the confidence that's drawn in like the sun over the dark mountains coming forth. He's given him praise. He's given him glory because he understands that his life is in God's hands. Last week, I also went to Psalms 150. And it says, praise the Lord. The psalmist is now telling us, he's saying, praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Praise him in the mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according, <clears throat> excuse me, according to his excellence and greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with timbrels and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I'm kind of dry this morning. I'm sorry. You see, the word Yahweh occurs more than... 6,800 times in the Old Testament. It appears in every book except for Esther, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. And as the sacred personal name of Israel's God, it was eventually spoken out loud. You see, the priest wouldn't even speak the name Yahweh. That's how much reverence they had. Nobody, only, only inside the Holy of Holies would they speak that name. That's how much reverence they had for God. It was eventually spoken out loud by the priests worshiping in the Jerusalem temple. And after the destruction of the temple in about uh, AD 70, the name was not pronounced, but Adonai was substituted for Yahweh. The Bible usually translates Adonai as Lord and Yahweh as Lord. Yahweh is the name that is most closely linked to God's redeeming acts in, in the history of his chosen people. Yahweh, I'm going to say it again, is the name that is most closely linked to God's redeeming acts in the history of his chosen people. Here you have the psalmist in Psalm 71 talking about how he knows that God is his fortress and his strong tower because what he has experienced in his communion with the Lord. He has watched God time in and time out take care of him in difficult situations and in easy situations. And in Psalms 150, the psalmist is saying, praise God in his, in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty firmaments. Last week I said, verse 1 says, praise the Lord. In Hebrew, this is hallelujah. Praise him if you're here. Praise him if you're there. Praise him. <clears throat> praise him if he's done this for you or praise him if he's done that for you. Praise him if you can play any kind of instrument. Praise him if you can just clash a cymbal. Finally, if, if you don't fall into any of these above categories, if you're not here or there, or if he hasn't done this or that for you, or you can't find a symbol to praise him with, the psalmist makes it simple. 
I can't help it, I'm going there, Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Green eggs. <laughs> you know, you got Dr. Seuss rolling around in that brain, and you also have Veggie Tales rolling around in that brain. <laughs> Green eggs and ham, Sam I am. Focus. <laughs> Focus. <laughs> You're all thinking it right now, aren't you? So I'm sitting here writing, right? Anyway, moving on. So if you're not in a tree, if you're not on a train, <laughs> if he hasn't done anything for you, if you're not over there or if you're not over here, if you don't have a symbol, the psalmist makes it simple. then let's stand up and take a praise break and let's give him some praise right where you are. Will you do that for me? Let's give him some praise because he's worthy of our praise. You need a breakthrough? Give him some praise. Give him some praise and watch the heavens open up over your home. Give him some praise and watch your healing begin to take place. Give him some praise and watch those relationships begin to get restored. Give him some praise and watch those finances begin to flow again freely. Give him some praise and see that sweet sleep come into your home at night. See, that wasn't so hard, was it? Amen. You may be seated. You see, the Bible encourages us to, and exhorts us to and even commands us to praise the Lord. So, so what is praise? Praise means by implication to celebrate God in song, to sing a hymn. What does praise mean? It means to celebrate God in song and to sing a hymn to him. Now, you know, we are in a society that's an all about me and my comfort. It's all about me. It's all about emotions. How does that make you feel? Man, I hear some of the silliest stuff. How does that make you feel? You have to go on how you feel because it's all about you. Everything is catered to you. It's all about me and my comfort. It's all about me and my space. It's all about if you say something to me that's offensive, that's offensive. I've got to go run off to my safe space. And it's all about our comfort and our luxury. You know, in our first church that we pastored down in lower Alabama, Evergreen, there was a guy there. His name was Mac Williams. It was, he was a very humble, quiet, loving, tender, big giant of a man. And I'll never forget, we're sitting there and we're in an interview meeting, kind of, if you will. And he's wearing a pair of those dicky onesies, you know. What are they called? Well, yeah, but they got the sleeves and stuff like that, right? Coveralls, right? He's in a pair of those. And he's sitting there and he's got his little shoes that got the Velcro on them. You know, and I look down at his socks, he's got his leg crossed, and his socks are tore right there. And I thought to myself, you know, if, I, if they do ask me to come pastor this church, I'm buying that man a pair of brand new socks. You know? I'm a, I, later I found out he's probably like the wealthiest man in <laughs> Conecuh County. <laughs> and he cuts his socks because they're too tight around his legs. <laughs> yeah. You know, I forgot how I was going there. <laughs> oh, so I get to know this guy. Huge heart, do anything for you. And one time we were sitting there and he said, it was uh, Veterans Day, and he came to me and he opened up his wallet. It was one of those bi uh, bifolds, not trifolds, you know. Opens this wallet up and pulls this picture out, an article that was laminated. And, and he, here he was in World War II, and he got some kind of medal of bravery or something like this. And he pulls this article out, and he talks about this young man from Evergreen, Alabama, and how he saved his troop or his platoon. And they were taking heavy gunfire from a sniper, and they couldn't find him anywhere. 
And he was in charge of those little grenade launchers. You know, you put them down, drop it down, the tube goes, boom, and launches it out there. That's what he was in charge of. So he got himself in a position, and they could generally see about where it was, but he was too far out. He started dropping grenades until that tree fell. And his whole troop was able to get out of that foxhole and get to safety. You know, it's something to be said about that generation. Not knocking on this generation, but the way our culture is teaching us, it's all about you and your comfort. It's all about you. It wasn't about Mr. Williams' comfort when he risked his life, taking the chance and never being able to see his young bride or his baby at the house ever again, getting out of that foxhole and making a sacrifice for everyone else. If he died, but the rest of his troop would have made it, that's the goal. Not necessarily to die, but to get his troop out of there. And church, when we get such an attitude that it's about me, we forget the concept of praise. Because praise is the absolute opposite of me. It's a denial of me. Some people like to praise themselves. That's about but some people like to praise themselves. But see, here the psalmist learned the importance and the power of praise. He learned the importance and the power. He learned that there was life in praise. You see, praise is about celebrating God. Praise is about singing songs to him. Now, worship, worship is a little different. Worship is where you prostrate, prostrate yourself on the ground before the Lord. You pay homage, you humble. You, it's like royalty. You're, you're putting yourself in a very humble position. That's worship. Worship, you're, you're, you're down and you're like, Lord Jesus, and you're giving him worship. Praise is an exuberant expression of your faith. Praise is one of these things where your hands are held high and, and your voice is lifted up. That's why the psalmist talks about a symbol or, or smacking a symbol or making noise unto the Lord because it's a celebration time. And there's power in that celebration time. You see, so when the Bible tells us to praise him, it's calling us to give or to vent to our adoring heart. Worship can be silent, but praise never is. Whether there is a song, whether the song is fast or slow or applause or a shout, it's irrelevant. <clears throat> but we are all called to articulate our adoration or the adoration of our heart to him through praise. Let me put it this way. We are to articulate our love, our devotion, our care, our fondness, our affection that's inside of our heart for him through praise. This is all about the presence of God. This is all about church being in the presence of God. This is why praise is so difficult for people because, because praise is a selfless act. It's expressing a love or devotion to someone other than ourselves. And the enemy is, is doing a great job trying to get our focus on ourselves in this world today, in the society that we're living in. Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. When you're praising God, how many felt joyful in here this morning during that praise and worship set? How many felt like you could run through a mountain or run through a troop and leap over a mountain this morning? How many, how many felt that through that praise, you were able to redirect your focus on your situation just a little bit? It gave you a little bit more of a bird's eye view in that praise this morning. You see... Psalms 95 says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. When everything else is collapsing, when everything else is being destroyed, when everything else is being wiped out, you're standing on the rock, which is your salvation, which gives you all that much more to praise him about because you're watching all this go on around you, but it's not touching you. This is why we got to share the gospel of Jesus 
Christ with a friend that, that does not go to church, that does not know him. We got to help our friends get on the rock because there's going to be a day, friend. I'm telling you right now, there's going to be a day if you're not standing on that rock, everything else is going to be that shifting sand and it's going to disappear. It's going to be destroyed. But only those that are standing on the rock giving him praise will survive. Just a side note here. We're getting ready for Resurrection Sunday. So we're going to be coming after you for seven names of people that you know that don't attend church. Not only do we want their seven names, but we want their addresses too. Because we can pray all day long, but faith without deeds is just dead. And it's time to put deeds behind our faith. So we're going to be coming after you for seven names and seven addresses. And we're going to send a personal invitation to them because we want to help you reach your friends with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to help you as your church body. We want to help you reach your friends so that they too can be standing on the same rock you're standing on. You see, the designation, the rock of our salvation in Psalms 95.1 is applied to the Lord as his role as the divine warrior. He defends and delivers his people. So you don't say, I'm praising silently. You can't praise silently. You may be worshipful, you may adore, but praise requires action and a voice. So why am I being so specific about praise this morning, church? Because there's power in his praise. There is power in the lifting your voice in a song or a shout or, or a prayer, a, a prayer of praise. Something happens when we applaud and magnify God. We're going through our true fire and true identity curriculum, and it's talking about giving our kids a time of silence before the Lord. It's talking about a time when we can help and instruct and lead our students to just turn their palms up like this and get silent before the Lord to clear the distractions of what's going on in the world today and just get quiet before their God. Before our God, the one true God. You see, this is what your students are going to start learning here shortly. Because this is all part of the agenda of the kingdom of heaven. Train up your children the way they should go. We're here to partner with you, parents. We're not here to parent your child, but we're here to partner with you. We're here to help you in the spiritual ramifications or the spiritual education of your children. And we're also here to help you. Teach your children how to practice the presence of God. Whew. Imagine that. Imagine an eight-year-old who learns how to practice getting into the presence of God. Oh, come on. You talk about the rate of students leaving the church when they graduate dropping. Holy, I'm telling you what. You teach a child how to practice the presence of God and they begin to practice and the Holy Spirit of God comes upon them and they get consumed with the presence of God when tribulation and trials come their way, when temptation comes their way. You know what? They're going to know what to do. They won't have to come and ask you because you've already trained them. They'll begin to praise God and they'll say, no way, man. What I got is too much greater than what you're offering me. That's the, whew, I got to move on. Mm, mm -mm. See, there's power in praise. See, the enemy does not want you and your life or your voice to be lifted up to God. My first point this morning, it's already up there. God or praise releases God's presence. You know, in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13, 14, it's the opening of Solomon's temple. When was the last time that you saw God's glory in such an awesome way? And the people were just were simply unable to proceed. I said it last week, and I'm gonna say it again. I I 
I feel like we're getting close. But I'm longing for that day, friend. I am longing for that day. When it's like all the tradition of church gets sucked out the back door because the house is filled with the Shekinah glory cloud where nobody can do anything but worship God. That's it, plain and simple. Where people are praising him, where people are worshiping him, where people are being set free, where people are getting a real revelation of who God truly is. And saying, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my worldliness. I want to be more like you. I'm looking for that time because there's no time like that time. That's such a cleansing, purifying time. Because all of a sudden, like I said last week, you're measuring your life to that pendulum. And the saving, redeeming Jesus is standing there saying, come on, son and daughter, walk out of that darkness and walk into my light, walk into the freedom. And friend, let me tell you something. When you begin to walk into that freedom, it brings the joy of the Lord as your strength. That's, that sums it up. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, when the joy of the Lord fills my heart, it makes me want to praise him all that much more. It helps me redirect my focus off my circumstances and put them where they belong, on him, on the cross, on the solid rock, and I choose to stand. You see, praising God releases his presence. I'm praying for that. I'm expecting the glory, of the, gl- the glory of God in such a way that, that Pastor Ted, <clears throat> our prepared song list is forgotten. Announcements are completely released. We forget and lose all sense of time. I'm praying that the praise is so electric, the preaching is so anointing, that the gifts of the Spirit are flowing and no one knows quite what God is going to do next, nor do they care what God's going to do next. All they care about is they're in the presence of their Father and their Father is loving on them, embracing them with arms wrapped around them, ministering to their needs, healing their broken heart and setting the captive free friend Mm. it's good to be in God's house this morning amen the glory of God is in this house friend the glory of God is in this house and it's time for a breakthrough you see here's the deal A breakthrough to me just requires a go for it kind of attitude. You can sit on the couch and be an armchair referee all day long. Or you can go for it. You can go for it. Why have we seen some of the healings in this house? I believe the praise in this house is getting stronger and stronger. Why are we seeing some of the healings take place? Because we're going for it. We're not just laying our hands in Jesus' name saying, be healed. We're saying, okay, let's see the manifest presence of the healing that God is doing in your life. We're calling it out. Let me see, do something that you couldn't do. Let's do it right now. Let's see. Come on, Jesus, heal this person. You see, it's time for a breakthrough. It's time that the church is no longer complacent. The church can't sit back any longer. The church has to go for it. The church has to go for it. If the church isn't going to go for it, I'm telling you, and Luke, it talks about when Jesus is riding in and the people are crying out and some people are trying to hush him. He's like, either they cry out or the rocks will cry out. You see, I'm telling you, there'll be something else in your stead and I want to be the one going for it. I want to be the one calling in the breakthrough. I want to be the one saying, God, here am I. Use me. Here am I. The prophet's saying in the presence of the Holy of Holies, he's realizing just how unclean and how unfit he is for the kingdom of heaven. How many has ever felt that way? Come on now. Get your hands up if you ever felt that way. You know what? Let me tell you something. Don't feel that way anymore. Be like the prophet Isaiah. Step forward and say, I'm going for a breakthrough. Step forward and say, here I am, use me. Step forward and say, I'm going for it. I don't care what I feel like. I I know I'm I'm unworthy. But we don't need to focus on the fact that, that my life without Jesus is nothing but filthy rags. What we need to focus on the fact is that when I begin to give him praise, God begins to fill me. I begin to do all things through Christ. And Christ is the one that gives me the strength to do what he's called me to do. 
come on now, that's, that's just right up that alley. We need to give some shouts on that one because that's the key of life right there. That's the way Christians need to be walking as believers. Hmm. That go for it type of attitude. I got to keep moving. God dwells in the praises of his people. Psalms 23, or excuse me, Psalms 22, 3 says, but you are wholly enthroned in the praise of Israel. Translation, God inhabits when you begin to praise. You know what? God's kingdom comes down right where you are when you begin to praise God. His kingdom comes out. He's like, you know something? Keith is over there praising me. Come on, let's set up our kingdom right here. Let's set up our kingdom. And where that kingdom is, the enemy cannot invade. Where that kingdom is, there is holiness in the midst of that kingdom. Do you understand? There's refreshing in the midst of that kingdom. There's the joy of the Lord. He is your strength. There's a renewing in the presence of that kingdom, friend. Tanya's been on me. Good Lord, that woman has not let me off that couch much at all this week. When she goes, I get up. She'll be in the basement. What are you doing up there? Um, um, <laughs> disobeying you? She's like, now you got to drink plenty of water. I'm like, well, wait a second. You want me to stay on the couch, but I got to drink plenty of water. Is there something I don't know? <laughs> When you starve yourself of water, you get dehydrated. Amen? When you starve yourself of water, you get high. When you starve yourself of food, you get hungry and thin and weak. And if you do it too long, malnutrition sets in. What happens when you starve yourself praising God? What happens when you starve yourself getting in the presence of God in that capacity? What happens when you starve yourself from the kingdom of heaven setting up camp right where you are because God inhabits the praises? What happens to your spiritual self? We, we want to do all these great exploits for God, but do we spend the time getting into that breakthrough power of praise? You see, praise releases victory as well. Second Chronicles chapter 20, 15 through 22, this is Jehoshaphat. And he just gets word. Let me just paraphrase it. He just gets word that there's a mass, great multitude mounting against him. So what happens? He's like anybody else. The Bible even says it. And Jehoshaphat feared. But what did he do when he feared? He set himself to seek, and, to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout the entire region. Here's this massive army mounting up against them. They only got one thing in mind. They're going to destroy him. Jehoshaphat's aware of this. Jehoshaphat knows that they can't take him head on. Wow, get ready, friend, because here comes that kingdom living mentality. You see, a great multitude came. Jehoshaphat set himself to seek the Lord, called a fast to come seek the Lord. Then the Lord speaks to Jehoshaphat and says, don't worry, the battle is not yours, it's mine. This is how I want you to handle this. And, and for the sake of time, this is what the Lord told him to do. You send your praisers, your worshipers out in front. We're going to send the praisers out in front. We're going to send the praisers out in front. But don't worry, because this battle is not yours, it's mine. And I'm telling you right now, church, if we could learn how to send the praise out in front. When we see the circumstance mounting on the wall, if we could learn how to send the praise out front first. If we could learn how to, instead of saying, oh my, but saying, oh, he is on the throne. Oh, he is high and lifted up. Oh, I can do all things through Christ because he'll give me the strength. I see that circumstance coming. I see that great multitude coming at me like a freight train. But greater is my God. Greater is my God. And I am standing on the rock. They're not standing on the rock. I'm going to praise him because I'm on the rock.
You need a victory in some area of your life. Instead of focusing all the time on that situation, on that mountain, start praising him because God inhabits your praises. Praise is a great way to resist the devil. The devil, his most common method of attacks are to bring discouragement, negativity, hopelessness, despair into our lives to paralyze us from what we get and from getting our eyes off of God. He comes in and he tries to strike fear, negativity, discouragement, hopelessness, despair. It's kind of like in, in, in Matthew chapter 14 when, when, when Jesus is walking on the water and the disciples see him and they're like, hey, there's a ghost out there. And Jesus said, what? Do not fear. Peter said, if it's you, Lord, tell me to come. Jesus is like, well, then come. And the minute Peter stepped out of the boat, he began to walk on the water. It was only until he took his eyes off the water that he began to sink. Because there was a bit of a storm there. And he started focusing on the, on, the, on the surroundings of his life. Every step was a step that was on the rock. That's why he didn't sink. And when he took his eyes off of God or Jesus and put his eyes on the great multitude, he began to sink and he cried out, Jesus. And the Lord picked him up and put him on the boat. And he's like, oh, you have little faith. What's that lesson all about? That lesson is all about us keeping our eyes on God. That lesson is all about us learning how to praise him. Because Pastor Ryan, when we praise God, we take our eyes off the world's problems and we put them on him and we let him be our warrior. We let him be our, our, our commander in chief who goes out in front of us and does our battle for us. All we have to do is follow him. You see, if that is what it's about in your life, then the best way to deal with him is to praise the Lord. Get your eyes back on God and his greatness. Declare his praises. Sing and shout of his love and his faithfulness and his goodness and his mighty power and watch the enemy flee. You see, his power of discouragement and his lies will be broken. Matthew 6, Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all, everybody say all, all, his righteousness and all these things. Fourth, and I'll, I'll close on this one. Praise releases the heaviness. Praise releases the heaviness. How many has ever felt heavy? How many has ever felt weighed down, overwhelmed, swallowed up, can't win? This always happens to me. Am I speaking to anybody or am I just reading my diary from yesterday? <laughs> Joke's on you, I don't have a diary. <laughs> just kidding. How many can relate to that? Come on, let's be real. Confession is good. Listen to what Isaiah chapter 63 says. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And the opening of the prisons to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. Verse 3, to console those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes. To give them the oil of joy for mourning. And the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Mm, think about that. Changing that garment. How many remember? <laughs> sorry, we're going here. How many remember Charlie Brown? How many remember Pigpen? He's walking along. He is called Pigpen for a reason. 
this cloud of dirt around him all the time. Right? See, that's what the devil's got us walking like, pig pen. There is a price that paid where we can walk like royalty with royal robes, right? But the devil said, no, here, take these instead. So we walk around like pig pen with a cloud around us, a cloud of heaviness. And, and the Lord is telling us, the Lord is telling us right here in Isaiah chapter 3, the latter part, he is saying, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The garment of praise. While we are sitting down here praising and worshiping God, between the presence of God in this house, in the throb in my foot, I was torn. I kind of want to sit down because I know I'm going to be on my feet for a little bit. But on the same token, I don't want to sit in the presence of the king. I want to put on the garment of praise and let the spirit of heaviness come off. You see, church, you got to understand that when you praise God, it releases a heaviness off your life. A heaviness that you weren't designed to carry. Exchange that spirit of heaviness for praise. Praise feels like a sheer act of the will and determination to push through. David, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. This is his cry out. My last point, and I'll get it, do, do it real quick. Praise releases freedom. Favorite, one of the favorite examples of this, Acts chapter 16, verse 25 and 6. But at the midnight, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great, great earthquake so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. This is the greatest prison revival you ever did here, friend. That's what praise does. Imagine what the praise in your home would do in your neighborhood. We're talking in the spiritual realm, of course, but these guys are sitting in a prison praising. They're sitting in a dungeon and they're praising God and everyone is getting set free because of their praise. Even, even the, the Debbie Downers and the... And the, and the you know, maybe I ought to use like Sister Bucket Mouth and, and <laughs> that kind of stuff like that. They're sitting in those prisons and because two people were praising and singing hymns, everyone was loosed and set free. I've said it before. Maybe you need to be that one on your pew that's the praiser that helps set the rest of your pew on fire. You may, you may not realize it, but there might be some, someone on your pew that doesn't even know Jesus. And because of your praise and worship, you're, you're helping the chains of heaviness come off and you're teaching them how to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Maybe their chains and shackles will be broken. Maybe their cages will be opened. You, you know what Tanya's teaching on this morning? She's teaching on things that are broken and how God can heal them with our kids. You know, you know what we're teaching on this morning? How if things are broken in your life, how you can get freedom and healing just by praising him. Lesson number one of this story is that the circumstances we find ourselves in ought to be irrelevant in our determination to praise God. This is what somebody that's got to go for kind of mentality has. They're not letting their circumstance dictate their relationship or their praise to God. If you're not quite at that point yet, there's no sense of being ashamed because only the enemy would try to make you feel ashamed. I'm here to tell you this morning that you can walk in that great breakthrough power as soon as you get your mind wrapped around that your circumstances don't define who you are, but the King of Kings has already defined who you are. And you just need to walk in it. Whatever prison you find yourself in, begin to praise the Lord. Get your eyes off the bars and on to Jesus. Praise him, exalt him, and testify of his goodness and power. Pastor Ted, you want to come on up here now? I made a little note 
on my notes. I wrote off to the side, praise causes you to refocus your attention. When you came in this morning, you might have come in with carrying some baggage, some heaviness. When we got into praise and worship this morning, it began to cause you to refocus your attention to him. You see, there's something about gathering together as a body of believers. There's something about coming to church. There's something about having people help fight with you and fight for you in a corporate as the body stands together that's important. Church, I want to I want to talk to you this morning and I want to encourage you this morning that there is power in your praise. James talks about our tongue, there's life and death in the power of our mouth. The life comes when we praise him. The life comes when we praise him. Would you stand with me, please? I know we've got just a couple more things we want to handle in service this morning, but I just want you to stand with me. Um, in Acts chapter 19, it talks about how Paul's aprons and his, and his hankies were taken. He prayed, and they'd take them, and they'd, they'd lay them on sick people, and they'd be healed. And so Keith came to me, Smith came to me, and he's got a, a, a relative, is it? A friend that's struggling. And her daughter's got cancer. Why don't you come up here? It'd be a little easier for you. <laughs> anyway, we want to anoint this bear. He's going to send this bear off to her. Well, the story is she sent the bear. She sent the bear to my wife when she was in a coma. And this bear was put together uh, by the ladies of her church. And they're called prayer bears because they were prayed over and they were to be sent out to people who needed prayer in their life. And she, out of the goodness of her heart, sent this to my wife. And I just felt like her daughter is struggling with cancer and that we, I need to do that. But we're just going to recharge him, so to speak. <laughs> and we're going to send him back to her daughter uh, as she fights cancer this morning. So as you reach your hands this way, and we're just going to, this is a symbol that represents God's healing. We're going to pray. What's her name? Jill. Lord God, we come on behalf of Jill to you, Lord. Father, and the doctors have said that she has cancer, Father. But we know what your word says, and we stand on your word, that, that, that by your stripes she will be healed. And Lord, the elders of the church are in this room right now. We are praying for her healing right now. So in Jesus' name, we rebuke this cancer seed. And we speak your holy DNA through her veins, Lord. Father, I pray that as she receives this bear, Lord, that her faith will be charged, God. I pray that as she receives this bear that is a symbol of faith and prayer, God, that when she receives this, she'll feel the presence of your Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray that she will be healed, Lord God, in your holy, precious name. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for this act of faith, Lord God. Father, we pray that the anointing will be sent, God. And we pray that the anointing will be sent to her and that she will be healed in your precious name. Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you as Keith obeys your voice, Lord. Like David obeyed your voice. What can a small shepherd boy with a sling and a stone do? He can tear down the works of the enemy. That's what he can do. And so let this be the sling, or let this be the stone in the sling, this bear, to tear down this work in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.